All right, good morning. Appreciate you being with us today. Those of you that are joining via live stream or watching on YouTube, thank you for being with us as well. Got much to be in prayer about today. Got several folks that are sick. Just pray that God would touch them. I know a lot of people with the cold weather, especially with the temperatures we saw this morning, uh, were a little bit hesitant to get out. Can kind of understand that as well. Uh, but uh, just be much in prayer uh, for those that are sick, those that are recovering, that God would just continue to touch. But it's awfully good to have you all with us today. Like I said, via live stream or here in the sanctuary. Thank you for being with us. Got a lot going on. Uh, as far as our announcements go, let me just go ahead. First off, check your, if you got your bulletin, uh, you've got the little pink sheet for the calendar there of all the different things going on. Uh, also, want to make this announcement, so please listen up real closely. Uh, the intent, we had announced previously that uh, there was going to be a work day Tuesday at Brother Steve and Sister Wilma's house to help clean up uh, all the things there. Uh, they have asked that we postpone that because they're still waiting on some paperwork uh, to make sure of some things before they bring people onto the site to try to do that. So as of right now, that's being canceled, or at least well, not canceled, really just postponed until they get that documentation uh, so that they can look at everything and make sure that everything's kosher there. Uh, so uh, just keep that in mind. Uh, I'm going to be uh, out of town this week, uh, leaving out in the morning, coming back on Saturday, as I do every year about this time. Uh, Sabrina's dad and I go up to uh, just below Roan Mountain there to Fairhaven Ministries, and I'm going to work on some school stuff and, and some things like that. So uh, two things. Uh, the communication will come if they decide to do it at the end of the week. Let's say they get the paperwork tomorrow or whatever, and they decide to do it toward the end of the week or something like that. The communication will come from the church, um, and it'll be on Facebook page. They'll announce it here in the services. Brother Mike's preaching Sunday, uh, or Brother Mike's preaching Wednesday night. Uh, Brother Brandon is preaching Sunday morning. Brother Dave Taylor's preaching Sunday night. Uh, so any announcements like that will come uh, from there. Uh, in addition to that, if you need anything, because the, fe the cell service uh, up at Fairhaven uh, is intentionally bad. <laughs> they don't want people getting sidetracked if they're up there to rest or to have a sabbatical or whatever. So the cell phone service is really, really, really spotty. Uh, so I'm going to be pretty much out of touch. So if you need anything, you know of anything uh, like that, or you've got questions, contact your deacon or call the office here, Miss Tammy. Uh, it's kind of going to be a focal point on a lot of that stuff as well. Uh, so, like I said, just don't, uh, if, it's not that I don't want you to holler at me, it's just the fact that I won't get it, at least not with any kind of real um, regularity or anything like that. You might send me a text on Monday, I might not get it till Wednesday, uh, with the way the service is up there. So, uh, uh, please keep those things in mind. But the work day has been postponed at least for a short time until they can kind of get all the paperwork squared away. Pastor Deacon Fellowships tomorrow night, 6.30. Uh, uh, the uh, Parents' Night Out is Friday, February the 11th from 6 to 9. Please sign up in the foyer for that. Donations of $5 a child is appreciated but not required. If you'd like to, in, to help with that, please see Miss Wendy. And then the Youth Wilds trip is scheduled for June the 6th through the 11th. Uh, please see Christy Moore about registration. Uh, and because the early bird discount ends on February the 1st. Uh, so keep those things in mind. Again, check out your calendar. Make sure uh, anything that applies to you, you mark it down on whatever calendar you use uh, to keep up with those kind of things, whether it's on your phone or uh, on a calendar on the wall or whatever it is. All right? So let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll get right on into our service today, okay? My Heavenly Father, we come to you thanking you so much for the privilege and the opportunity that we do have to be gathered together today. Father, I pray for those that are not able to be with us today because they're sick or they're traveling. Or Father, recovering, I pray that you just have your hand upon each of them, keep them safe, help them to get better, whatever the need is. And Father, we'll just thank you for all that you do there. Father, I pray that you'd be with our children's churches as they're meeting this, uh, this morning. I pray that the lessons will touch hearts, and if there's a child that comes to the point that they realize that they're lost, that today would be the day that they'd come to Christ as Savior. And then, Father, I pray also for our service. I pray that you'd have uh, your way in it. Use me as I try to preach the truth of the Word of God. Father, I pray that you'd bless Sabrina as she sings. Use her to be a blessing as well. 
And Father, we're just going to give you the praise for all that you do. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right, you pray for Sabrina. I stood before the cross and a king stood by me and on the other side a vagabond and there as we prayed and poured our hearts out to Jesus he bent to Jesus' name, and a king can do the same. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. No matter who you are, whether rich or a beggar, the call is sent to who? Just kneel at the cross and tell the Lord that you need him. Your thirsty soul he will fill. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. No name and a king can do the same the ground is level at the foot of the cross no power can take away all the joy I found in Jesus although the world will try to shake God's word is still the same and it will stand throughout the ages your every step he'll help you take the ground is level at the foot No man stands higher than I. I can call on Jesus' name, and a king can do the same. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. I can call on Jesus name and a king can do the same the ground is level at the foot of the cross aren't you glad that we all have equal access to the cross of Christ. What a blessing. Well, like I said, it's good to see you today. If you have your Bibles, we're going to do something a little different. We don't normally uh, go to two different passages of Scripture for the message, but there's a parallel passage here that we need to take a look at. So if you would, turn in your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter number 23, 
and also 1 Chronicles chapter number 11. 1 Chronicles chapter number 11. So 2 Samuel 23 and 1 Chronicles 11. Just a short little account here uh, that God had burdened my heart with over the last couple of weeks is just trying to keep up with things and watch things and uh, pay attention to what's going on not only in... <coughs> Excuse me, not only in our country, but the world as well. Uh, I try to be good. If I had sneezed like I normally do, you'd all have been deaf. Uh, be nice. Next time I'll let her rip and you all go home with your ears ringing. I don't care. <laughs> uh, but as, as I've been paying attention and just listening and watching things and, and, and trying to be tender to the Holy Spirit of God, he led me to this passage of Scripture, these two passages of Scripture, really, uh, with a particular thought, and I think you can see it up here on the board, fired on the TVs, fighting with a purpose. Now, we'll talk a little bit more about why that title here in just a moment, but let's start with 2 Samuel 23, and let's start reading in verse number 8. Second Samuel 23, verse number 8. These be the names of the mighty men whom David had. Now, let's remember for just a second that David, when it talks about David and his mighty men, these were particular soldiers who were very um, gifted, and I use that term very carefully, gifted by God to fight and to lead in amazing ways. Uh, more than what you would think of just as a normal soldier. These were men that God touched and used them in just ways that in our human understanding sometimes seems to hard to grasp. But it says, These be the names of the mighty men whom David had, the Tachmanite that sat in the seat, chief among the captains. The same was Adino the Esnite. He Now look at this. He lift up his spear against 800 whom he slew at one time. And after him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo the Ahohite, one of the three mighty men with David when they defied the Philistines that were there gathered together to battle, and the men of Israel were gone away. He arose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary, and his hand clave unto the sword. And the Lord wrought a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to spoil. Now, let's go over now to 1 Chronicles chapter number 11. And we'll start reading in verse number 10. 1 Chronicles 11, verse number 10. These also are the chief of the mighty men whom David had who strengthened themselves with him and his kingdom and with all Israel to make him king according to the word of the Lord concerning Israel. And this is the number of the mighty men whom David had. Uh, Joshua Boam and, uh, and Hachmanite, the chief of the captains, he lifted up his spear against 300 slain by him at one time. Now get this. After him was Eleazar. This is the same guy. The son of Dodo the Ahohite, who was one of the three mighties. He was with David at Pazdaman, And there the Philistines were gathered together to battle where was a parcel, parcel of ground full of barley. And the people fled from before the Philistines, and they set themselves in the midst of that parcel and delivered it and slew the Philistines, and the Lord saved them by great deliverance. So this Eleazar, we see two different details about this particular battle that was fought with him alongside of David. So that's going to be the focus of our message today as we look at this thought of fighting with a purpose. Let's pray. Father, use me now just to share what you've burdened my heart with. May it be a help and a blessing to us, encouragement. Father, well, may it challenge our hearts to stand and do what you would have us to do. And we'll just give you the praise for what you do through us and in us and for us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. I don't know how many of y'all have been keeping up with a lot of the stuff that's been going on outside of our country. Uh, but especially with our neighbors to the north. 
If y'all will remember back when all of the COVID stuff was kind of at its highest point, we had certain states uh, that were banning Christian churches from meeting. Uh, if you remember, John MacArthur's church at Grace Community was one of those churches that the city of California, or the state of California and the city there where they live had said, you cannot meet. Uh, of course, we know that MacArthur defied that. They met anyway. They tried to take away their parking places and the synagogue, of all things, the synagogue next door said, well, we don't meet on Sunday. We meet on Saturday. You can use our parking lot. <laughs> and so they just moved the parking over there. And God did tremendous things. Uh, and the church stayed open. Uh, and then in addition to that, when all of the court cases were said and done, uh, the Grace Community Church uh, won all of the challenges, and the city actually ended up owing them some money is what happened. Now, I'm not, let me say this as I get into this, I am not saying that every church has to do what every other church is doing whether it's closing their doors or keeping them open at a particular time or whatever else. Every church needs to do what makes the most sense for that church and that congregation at that particular time. Okay, so this is not a debate about whether you stay open or whether you close. What this is a discussion of is that when Grace Community Church and John MacArthur took the stand that, uh, that they did, they were actually actively opposed and threatened with daily fines from the government because they did what they thought was right in the eyes of God. Now, in Canada, we've had at least two pastors arrested and jailed for no other reason but staying open during the pandemic. They met all of the requirements of secular institutions that uh, people that they said the secular places could stay open. They met all of those requirements, but because they were a church, they, uh, they uh, arrested and have jailed, and, and one of them has been arrested twice at this point and jailed over the, the defying the law that was telling them they had to close when they were doing what everybody else was doing and allowed to stay open. I was listening to a radio program Friday. I got an email or a, t a Facebook post from a friend that had the two most dangerous words for me in the English language, and that was free books. And Moody Bookstore in Johnson City is closing, and I got this post that said all the books were free. And so Friday afternoon, I drove up there just to see, and I, I came out with five books. I think one of them's worth something, the other four I'll probably throw away. But I went up there, and as I, was, as I was on the road, I was listening to the radio. And I listened to Justin Trudeau, who is the, is the Prime Minister of Canada, and I was listening to him on this news program, and he basically admits, admitted in this speech that if you didn't follow his edicts about some of these things, that you were basically a danger to the Commonwealth of Canada. And so, as I was listening to that, God had already burdened my heart with this message, but I was listening to Dodo and listening to him speak and, and all of those things. And it just reinforced what God would have us to look at today. And that's this idea of fighting with a purpose. You know, I don't know, I think, and I have perfect peace. Did we, have we done everything right at Holy Mountain Baptist Church over the last two years in relation to COVID? Probably not. I mean, especially in the first six months. I mean, we were changing plans sometimes on a daily basis just trying to keep up with all that's going on. But our primary concern was the safety of the people and our ability to still minister, even if it was in a different way. And to be honest with you, and this is a true credit to the leadership of this church, the children's church teachers who came in and would record their lessons and, 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 and the deacons and the people who would just get together and do something for our children at Easter and all of those kind of things. It is a true testimony to the love that this, the people of this church has for each other that we were able to weather the storm in the way that we did. 
and we're still dealing with issues. But as of today, while we have had several people in our church over the last two years have COVID, we've not had an outbreak in the church where it was a church-wide thing. Many churches had multiple families at the same time, and even in our area who have struggled because of that. And the Lord has blessed, I think, our faithfulness in trying to take care of folks and at the same time be faithful to the truth of the Word of God. But I'm going to be honest with you, and you've heard me say this a thousand times, and I guess maybe at this point you're all wondering, he probably really is, he's just trying to deny it. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. But sometimes you got to look at some of the stuff that's going on, and, and you have to recognize there's more going on than just what we're being told sometimes. And I really believe that a lot of what's happened and continues to happen in relation to COVID and everything else is just, a, is just testing the waters to see how much people will take and how much they will do. And, how, and you know, where, where does the breaking point come? I was listening to uh, another uh, news program, and they were talking about, and Sabrina, I think, actually, she read me an article as well, I guess it was last night or not before last we were talking about it, that said if you really want to see how far you can push people, start messing with the food supply. How many of y'all are having fun when you go to the grocery store? You got to go to four places just to find stuff that you usually didn't even have to think about finding. Sabrina's dad last night called the house. He'd been all over Kingsport to every grocery store looking just for one thing, and nobody had it. You go on Monday, and you can't get broccoli. There ain't that many people like broccoli. <laughs> I went yesterday to one establishment. I'll be nice. I won't name which one. starts with a W, but I ain't saying anything else. I go, I go to this one place. They had 10 green peppers that looked like they'd already been half eaten. <laughs> so I had to go to another store to find a green pepper. Same thing with bacon potatoes. They didn't have any bacon potatoes either. So I had to go to another store looking for a bacon potato. I'm not, I, I don't have fun with that kind of thing. But I'm pretty much... Uh, to some people's consternation, I'm relatively patient about most stuff. But you know as well as I do, all you got to do is look at Facebook, and you can see that a lot of people ain't patient. There's going to come a time, folks, and I truly believe this. If the Lord doesn't come back and rapture his church, there is going to come a time here pretty soon where we as a church are truly going to have to take a stand about us being open and about us ministering in the way that we feel God is leading us to minister. We're going to have to take that stand. And the truth of the matter is, the message this morning and the message tonight kind of dovetail together in respect to this idea of why are we doing what we're doing? So, or how are we doing what we're doing? Today's more the why, this morning. So let's look at this thought for a minute of fighting with a purpose. If you go back to 1 Samuel chapter 17, don't, we'll just, uh, but if you go back there and you'll read the passage, David stood with the armies of Israel as they cowered before Goliath and the rest of the Philistines. And David was being basically fussed at by his brother for even being there and making a ruckus about somebody needs to go out and fight this uncircumcised Philistine. And his brother gives him a hard time. And David looks at him in, verse no, in, in, in 1 Samuel 17, I think around verse number 29, he looks at him, and David looks at his brother, and he says, Is there not a cause? Is there not a reason to fight? So David knew that to fight, first of all, there had to be a sense of purpose in the battle. 
Because if you don't know why you're fighting and you don't have a un good understanding of why it's important that you fight, then guess what? Just like the people in the two parallel passages that we read here, it said the people left. They didn't fight for this ground that it talks about here. It was David and his mighty man Eleazar and some others who fought for the battle because there was a purpose in their mind. I'm afraid today, and let's just be honest, there are many Christians today that not only don't have a purpose as they fight, but in some cases they've decided, they've decided already that the fight is just too much or they've already, if over the course of their life, they fought enough and now it's someone else's turn. But can I tell you something? If you're still here, God's got a reason for you to be here. What we need today are Christians who are committed to the battle as the mighty men of valor that David surrounded himself with in the days of his reign were. One thing we know, David had men who were willing to fight not only because David himself, but just, not, just because or at least because David himself was willing to fight. And here's a call to us as leaders of this church. Everybody in this church needs to know why we're fighting for what we're fighting for, but we as the leaders of this church better have a real good handle on it. Because there's people who are going to be looking at us, and if we stand, they'll stand. If we don't stand, they're not going to stick their neck out because they're not sure what it is that they need to do. So as leaders of this church, whether you're a Sunday school teacher, whether you're a superintendent, whether you're a deacon, whether you're a children's church leader, it, whether you're working in Rama, whatever it is, as leaders of this church, we have to be on the front line of this thing and have that sense of purpose for why we're going to stand for what God wants us to stand for. It's a simple rule of leadership. You attract the kind of people that you as an individual are. Dr. Lee Robertson said many, many years ago, everything rises and falls on leadership. David, because of his willingness to fight the battles that God called him to, had these mighty men who would rally around him and fight. And so we as leaders, we need to make sure we're doing everything we can to follow God and that we're fighting the right battles at the right time, doing what God would have us to do in the way that God would have us to do it. And then as a church, we need to rally around the Lord Jesus Christ, not us as leaders, but around the Lord Jesus Christ, knowing he's the one that will give us the victory. But here in these two passages, we see four things that we as Christians need to get hold of if we're to fight the battles that God has given us to fight. And the first thing that we need to see is that there was a recognition that a defense needed to be made. Look again at 1 Chronicles 13, verse number, uh, or 1 Chronicles 11, 11, verse 13. He was with David at Pazdamon, and there the Philistines were gathered together to battle, where was a parcel of ground full of barley, and the people fled from before the Philistines. Now, as you look at, the, and in verse 14, and they set themselves, I'm sorry, and they set themselves in the midst of that parcel, and delivered it, and slew the Philistines, and the Lord saved them by a great deliverance. As I was reading this passage, the thing that jumped out at me was that last little phrase, or first little phrase in verse 14. And they set themselves in the midst of that parcel. Now, I'm one of these people, we did this when we talked about how to study the Bible and we looked at all of these things. And you have to ask yourself the question when you're studying, especially the historic passages of Scripture, why is this worded the way that it's worded? You know, what was going on here? And, and the thing that jumped out at me was that point that the Bible makes here that they were fighting in the middle of the field in the midst of the parcel why does it make this point about them fighting in the middle of the field well I think there were several reasons number one the land was their land and it had been and it had been, and it had been given to them by God 
They were defending a territory that was theirs. It was the Philistines that were the intruders. And by standing in the midst of the ground, it was a bold declaration that this belongs to my people because God has given it to me. Secondly, they didn't stand at the edge of the field because, let's face it, if you're at the back end of the field and the enemy is coming this way, and you're not in the middle of that field, and you see them coming, it's awfully easy to get that mindset of, well, they're already there. Don't guess there's too much reason to fight. It'd be fighting an uphill battle since they're already there in the middle of that field. So you don't want to be on the back edge of the field. And if you're on the front edge of the field, here's what happens. Well, I can give just a little. I got all this room behind me. I can give just a little. I can give just a little. But by standing in the midst of the field, there was nowhere to go but forward. So it makes this comment, they were standing in the middle of the field because it showed that they were in the very place where it, meant, it maximized the fact that they could not give up. I'm afraid today that the church has forgotten all that God has given them. And as a result, they've forgotten that there's a defense that needs to be made and a stand that needs to be taken. That the Bible is the inspired, inerrant, infallible Word of God. That the church is God's institution for spreading the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's going to come a time when we're going to have to understand that we're going to have to pledge allegiance to the cross over pledging allegiance to the flag. I hate that. But I fear that day's coming. That preaching is still the way to get that message to a lost and dying world. That every Christian should live a life of separation from the world and to the Lord. That we're to be a witness both in our walk and our talk. And that includes what we say and what we do inside the four walls. And it's going to include, or it should include, and will include what we do when we're away from here. There is a constant push over and over again to tell Christians that you have the freedom to worship. But what the Bible says is, is that we have the freedom of religion. That is a totally different thing. Freedom of worship limits you here. Freedom of religion means that because of what I believe, I can go out there and tell somebody else. And that's where we're heading. That Christ, that there's only one way to heaven, and that's through the Lord Jesus Christ, and that there's a hell awaiting those who reject Him. That Christ is coming back to take the church home with Him to be in heaven, and that every Christian should know what they believe and why they believe it and be willing to stand on it regardless of what the world, regardless of what the government, regardless of what current opinion and popular opinion says. We need to stand because we have a, something that's been given to us by the Lord Jesus Christ and that's the call to be His people in this world. Amen. But then secondly, and let's go over to 2 Samuel chapter 23 for a minute. We see that we have an enemy to engage. 23 verses 9 and 10. Actually, I just want to pull out one little phrase there in verse number 9. And after him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo, the Ahohite, one of the three mighty men with David, when they defied the Philistines. I like that phrase. They knew who the enemy was, and they stood against that enemy. Today, I'm afraid that many have lost, we've said, have lost the will and the desire to fight. We have to realize that there's an enemy to be resisted, but we also have to realize that it's not what we do that matters. It is God that gives the victory. Notice what it says about Eleazar, and I love this. It says in verse 10, He arose and smote the Philistine until his hand was weary, and his hand clave unto the sword. 
The only way that he would be able to fight, and he would fight so long and so hard that his hand had basically welded itself to the pommel of that sword was because, first of all, that sword had to be comfortable in his hand. If that sword hurts your hand, you're not going to be able to hold on to it too hard or too tightly. And the first rule of sword fighting is that the weapon has to be so comfortable in your hand that it's simply an extension of yourself. If it doesn't fit right in the palm of your hand, you'll tire out too easily or it'll get easily dislodged in the battle. So to fight with that sword, you have to be comfortable with it. And the Bible tells us that the Word of God is our sword. So the question is this morning, how comfortable are you in using it? There'll be two things that'll make your Bible uncomfortable to you. One, you don't know your Bible. It's unfamiliar to you. Remember, when David stood against Goliath, uh, Saul gave him his armor, and he said, hey, you put this on, and you go out there and fight him. And David said, I don't know this armor. I can't fight. It's uncomfortable. It doesn't fit me right. Folks, can I tell you something? The only way you're going to be able to stand for the Word of God is to know the Word of God well enough that it's comfortable in your hand and in your heart and in your mind. The other way that it's not comfortable is when you don't apply it. I don't believe there's anything in the world that will make a Christian lay down their Bible quicker than coming across a passage of Scripture that tells them they need to do something they don't want to do. They get to that passage of Scripture and it says, Thou shalt, and they go, No, I won't do that. And so they lay the Bible down and they don't use it anymore. It makes them uncomfortable. But I think another reason that the sword stuck in the hand of Eliezer because he was gripping it and he was gripping it tightly was because of his knowledge of the enemy. Eliezer knew these Philistines, and he knew that the slightest letdown on his part would be the chance for the enemy to get the advantage. He gripped that sword tightly because he knew that if he let down his guard for even a moment, it could be the difference between life and and death. And we need to hold on to the Word of God as we fight the devil because this is the only weapon we have to fight against him. And we have to realize that even though we may be standing against this and standing against that over there, the truth of the matter is the one who's bringing that battle to us is none other than Satan himself. And we need to know the enemy. But then thirdly, go back to First Chronicles 11 for a second. Because here we see that another reason that we have a purpose to fight is because there's a harvest to desire. He was with David at Pazdam, and again talking about Eliezer. And there the Philistines were gathered together to battle where was a parcel of ground full of barley. Now you think about that for just a minute. This wasn't just some ordinary field. This wasn't just some part of a valley. This was a field that had a harvest on it. But not only that, it was a field that would continue to have a harvest on it. Barley was the grain that was available to everybody. Now, wheat was usually reserved mainly for the rich, but... But barley was for everybody. And what we have to understand is that God has given each and every one of us a field that's ripe to harvest. We should not only be the workers in that field, but we ought to be defending that field as well. The Bible says in Matthew 16, 18, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I don't know where this came from in people's thinking. But I, you know, I've, I've heard that verse quoted since I was four years old in, in, in Sunday school. And somehow that verse got, we got this idea that when it talks about the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, that Satan's throwing everything at us. Have you ever seen anybody fight a battle with a gate? 
Think about that just for a minute. That's not what this is saying. This isn't about the devil throwing stuff at us. This is about us going after the devil. The gates of a city is what protected that city from an enemy. And what Christ is telling us here is that when we take the stand that he expects us to stand, take, knowing that he is our rock, that even while we're fighting for the souls of others, the gates of hell shall not prevail against us. It's not the devil coming after us. What Christ is saying is, here is that we need to go after the devil. But then lastly, there's a heritage to pass on. Where there was a parcel of ground full of barley. God gave the land of Israel to the children gave the land to the children of Israel. If the soldiers had retreated from that land, you get this. They wouldn't have had it to pass on to the next generation. We need to fight the battle so that we have a heritage to pass on to the next generation. We're always one generation away from closing the doors of a local New Testament church. Now, I know Christ said the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's the church as a whole. But all it would take is for us as a church not to train the next generation of leaders. Not to prepare them for what's coming. And it doesn't matter how hard we fought, the doors will still close. We have to realize that we have a heritage to pass on. Nehemiah chapter number 8, it says, And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they spoke unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. Did you get that? That last little phrase there? It was men and women and children. Everybody that could understand what was being said. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday before the men and the women and those that could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. Israel had come back after their captivity and they were trying, they had rebuilt the temple, they had rebuilt the walls. But the one thing that had not been really rebuilt in them was a sense of who they were and why they never needed to give that land up again like they had done previously. And the people came together and they st stood. Now you think about this. Imagine reading Genesis 1-1 all the way to the end of Deuteronomy taking till midday and the Bible said they stood as they read. Everybody stood. They were hungry. They wanted to know, why am I here? And what does God want me to do? Why? Because they didn't want to be taken into captivity again and all that God had given them be taken away for the generations that were coming. They had been on that side of the house and they didn't want to go there anymore. Then you go to Titus chapter number 2, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity and patience. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young men to be sober, to love their husbands, uh, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded in all things, Showing thyself a pattern of good works and doctrine. Showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned. That he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Did you get that? Older men, teach the younger men. Older ladies, teach the younger ladies. So that when the time comes... 
and you leave the scene, if the Lord doesn't come back, they'll know why they need to fight with a purpose. You know, for decades now, this has been going on that many churches don't have Sunday night and Wednesday night services. And the truth of the matter is the COVID restrictions has increased that geometrically. More churches today don't have anything but a Sunday morning service than it's ever been in, in, in many, 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 many decades. Now, don't get me wrong. I know the Bible does not say that thou shalt have Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night service. I know that. But what we're seeing is a gradual giving up of ground to where churches are saying if, it's, if there's not enough people there to pay the electric bill, then why bother opening the doors? Can I tell you something? By the grace of God and the strength and the provision that he gives us, we're going to meet. We may have to, like we did Wednesday night, say, hey, guys, let's take, it, let's take a day, give this thing time to run its course, and then we'll come back together on Sunday. Because I, you know, my argument all along was I would much rather dismiss a Wednesday night service in person and do live stream and then, then have Wednesday night and then five people show up sick on Friday and let's have to cancel Sunday. That way we knew who was going to be sick and everybody knew who was going to be sick and we kind of was able to, that way we knew we could meet on Sunday. That was the logic of that. Sometimes, like I said, we've done our best to take care of the congregation as well as feed the flock. But when you get into that habit, you know, and, and this is how it's happened. Let's just be honest. We've seen, you know, churches that met Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. The first thing they gave up was Wednesday nights. Well, it's a work week. We got a lot of stuff. You know, people got a lot of stuff going on. The more you know, uh, people in the workplace, you know, workforce, you know, the harder it is to get here on Wednesday night. We've only got a handful here on Wednesday night. I tell you what, let's do. Let's just dismiss Wednesday nights and or not have Wednesday night services, and we'll concentrate everything on Sunday morning and Sunday night. And then after a little while, what happens is is that the same Wednesday night crowd are the ones that are there on Sunday night, and then the same argument happens again. And then you close off Sunday night and Wednesday night, and now you try to do everything on Sunday morning. Let me tell you something. If I tried to do everything that God's burdened my heart with as far as preaching and teaching and everything on Sunday mornings, I'd have to live till I was 455 years old. They ain't enough hours in the week. We need to stand firm. And I know, and, and, and you know, this is a Sunday morning message. We need you here on Sunday night. We do. We need you here on Wednesday night. Remember what we talked about at the first of the message leaders? We got to be the ones standing first. Because if they don't see us fighting with a purpose, then, then others aren't going to see it either. We need to be here on Sunday nights. We need to be here on Wednesday nights. I know, sometimes you're sick. Sometimes you got work and you can't get away. I understand all of that. I've worked secular work for many, many years. And you know me, I've come in here uh, like when uh, I guess it was Wednesday night uh, that you know I didn't even get home before I had to come to church. I don't like preaching in blue jeans or teaching in blue jeans, but I'll do it if I didn't get a chance to get home and be here. If I need to be here to preach or teach, we need to be here. We need to fight with a purpose, and the only way we're going to fight with a purpose is if we have people sitting on squares doing the work that needs to be done. We've got pl places where we need people's help. And we've called and checked, and it's been, well, and I'm not being mean. Sometimes it's legitimate. I don't argue the point. But everybody can't sit in the same place and expect 
that everything is going to get done. Not only do we need you here, but bless God, we need you doing something. <laughs> I mean, let's just be honest. There's things that need to be done. There's slots that need to be filled, whether it's keeping a nursery or uh, filling in in a class or whatever else that it is. We need help. And the only way we're going to be able to stand in the fight is if we've got people on the battlefield. We're going to be doing a series on worship here very soon, starting about mid-February. And let me say something here. and it, Thankfully, this has not been a problem here, but I'm just telling you this is more forward-looking. we got a lot of churches in our area, and I'm, you know, every church has to answer for how they follow the Lord and what they want them to do. But let's be honest. There's a lot of churches in our area that concentrate a whole lot more on entertainment than worship. I'm going to say something now that God's burdened my heart with, and I'll be saying it, I, Lord knows how many times in that worship series, but it is what it is. Worship is an expression. It is not an experience. Worship is what we do. It is not what we get. I can remember seeing signs years ago that said, come to such and such church for an incredible worship experience. If you're the one experiencing it, the wrong one's getting it. We need to fight with a purpose. And part of that purpose is to lift up the one that's the only one worthy of worship. It's not about how good I feel when I get out of here. Although I thank God when I leave here, usually I feel pretty good. Except on some of them days, and then I want to go home and quit. Most of the time, I leave feeling pretty good. But it's not about what I get out of it. It's what I'm giving to the one who's the only one worthy of it. If you want to stop fighting with a purpose, get your eyes off Jesus. Get your eyes off God. And you'll forget why you're fighting. And you won't be fighting with a purpose anymore. I've shared my heart. Are you willing to fight with a purpose? We stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Father, Sabrina comes to play softly. Father, <laughs> I've shared what you burdened my heart with today. And I ask now that you would just have your way in the invitation. I don't know what needs to be done in the hearts of folks. You do. So, Father, I pray you'd have your way. Father, help us. I know what your will is. Your will is that we come together as a church and that we come together on Sunday mornings and Sunday nights and Wednesday nights and, and we work standing shoulder to shoulder, even if it's not the thing that we're the most comfortable with, even if it means we might have to do this instead of that, and, 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 and that we're worshiping you and not sitting there looking for something to make me feel better. If we'll do those things, we can have a solid foundation for fighting with a purpose. The Father stir up within us the heart of an Eliezer. May we grasp our sword and, we, and we, may we fight the battle so long and so strenuously that our hand is welded to the truth of the word of God so that our lives will follow. And we'll give you the praise for all that you do. Every head bowed, every eye closed to Sabrina plays softly. How about you this morning? Do you need to come? And just recommit yourself to fighting the battle. The time is drawing near where we're going to have to stand on a lot of things. And if you've not already made that commitment to stand now when things aren't bad, you won't make that commitment when things get hard. Let's just be honest. 
It's not a declaration of, boy, I must be bad to come up here at this altar. What it is is, Lord, I want to do what you want me to do, and I'm going to stand, and I'm going to fight, and I want you to give me the courage to do it. Now, will you come and say, God, give it to me. Help me to fight with a purpose. Some are coming. How about you? How about you? You can say, well, I'm already doing this and I'm already doing that and I'm already doing the other. Praise the Lord. I'm glad we need you in those positions. Thank you for your faithfulness to serve. But do you need to recommit yourself that if the battle turns ugly tomorrow, you're still going to be there? That you're going to ask God for the courage to stand and be and do and live what He would have you to do regardless of what you're already doing? And that if he moves you from this part of the parcel to that part of the parcel, you'll be willing to go. Do you need to cut? Do you need to cut? Are you fighting with a purpose? Or are you on the edge of the battlefield wondering who's going to win? Do you need to cut? My Heavenly Father, How I thank you for the liberty to share what you burdened my heart with this morning. <laughs> Father, it preached totally differently than what I expected. But I just tried to be obedient to you. Help us to fight. And not, not with each other, but fight with a purpose. May we be faithful, not just to this church. But Father, we need to decide we're going to be faithful to you, and that'll take care of the rest of it. Help us to fight so that we've got something to hand off to those who are walking behind us. Father, I want the next generation to have this same barley field to fight, defend, and grow from and be nourished by. And we'll give you the glory and the praise for all that you do in Jesus' name. Amen. All hearts and minds clear. All hearts and minds clear. Then don't forget, be with us tonight, 6 o'clock. We'll be uh, looking at another passage of Scripture. Interesting little title that God gave me is, Is Your Faith Built on Rock Candy? <laughs> Just pray that God will use it to be a help and encouragement to us, all right? All hearts and minds clear. Yes, ma'am. Amen. Amen. I'm sorry, what? Yes. Yeah. Right. Amen. Amen. Somebody is. Somebody is. Somebody is. Brother Paul Williams, you dismiss us. <laughs>